Welcome to this evening's meeting. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Simon Gromit. Um, he was one of my um, colleagues when I worked in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital at Birmingham. Uh, he's a consultant medical oncologist, and he's going to talk about his second session, um, which he did in a first session um, in June on first therapy uh, of met for metastatic disease. And he's going to continue on this with the second line therapy today and adjuvant treatments. Um, Simon will give you an opportunity at, at the end to ask questions and please do. Uh, and so then I'll, I'll hand you over to Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. Okay, Th thanks, Susan. You, you look a little bit like you're talking to us possibly from your toilet, but I'm sure you're not. No, um, I'm, 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 in the, I'm in the little spare, the little guest in the spare room. room. You're in the box yeah. room. I'm in the okay. box room. So um, thank you everybody for um, for joining us. I hope you can all see and hear me. I'm going to try and, uh, this is where my technology lets me down. I'm going to try and share my screen now with my slides on. So let me just uh, have a go at doing that. So hopefully you can see uh, my slides. Is that a nod from uh, from people? Yeah. OK, so my name is Simon Grummet. I'm a medical oncologist. Um, I am um, based in uh, Birmingham, where I've been for the last couple of years. And prior to that, I used to work in Wolverhampton. I've been treating kidney cancer for, gosh, about 17, 18 years now. And I've seen a tremendous change in how we treat uh, the disease in that time. Uh, in June, I gave a, um, a, a fairly brief overview of our um, first line options for treating advanced kidney cancer uh, and today I'm going to do a similarly relatively brief overview of the second line options so the treatments you'd be offered you know in your first line treatment has, has stopped being of benefit uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about adjuvant therapy which is a new development in, in renal cancer and, and has potential to really change um, people's uh, disease uh, kind of journey. So um, Current first line options. I'll briefly go over these because I mentioned these in June, but the people here may not have been around in June. Um, so we have various drugs that we can use as a first line treatment, and they fall into two main groups, which are what are called the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors or targeted agents. These are tablets that you take. They, they um, target the blood vessels, abnormal blood vessels in and around the tumor. And these are drugs such as sunitinib, pazopinib, and tivozinib. And some of these drugs have been around a good few years. Uh, and we, we tend to use them in people who've got less, slightly less aggressive disease. Um, and they can be quite effective. Um, then we have a, a type of treatment called immunotherapy. And immunotherapy is a bit different. It works by stimulating the patient's own white blood cells, their own immune system, to hunt down and attack the cancer cells. Now, there are various options for immunotherapy. Um, and the, most of the drugs that are used are what are called monoclonal antibodies. And this means this is a drug that's given as an infusion into the back of the hand or the arm um, and often given in combination with tablets. All the tablet treatments end in NIB and all the uh, immunotherapy monoclonal antibody treatments all end in MAB. And that's an easy way to kind of tell the difference between them. Their names are all totally unpronounceable and I have to practice them on the way into clinic so that I don't sound daft in front of the patients. Um, but there's lots of these in the first line setting that we can now use various combinations. Pembrolizumab and Lenvatinib is a, a new option for us that wasn't available when I spoke in June and actually looks very good indeed. Uh, but there's lots of options here, but I'm not going to go into these. But these are your first line treatments. So patients, depending on how aggressive their tumour is, depending on the patient's individual uh, situation and, f and factors will be offered one of these combinations usually as a first line treatment and will remain on it for as long as it is benefiting them, as long as the patient is tolerating it and as long as the patient is happy to be on it. But with many of these treatments, a time will come when the treatment is no longer benefiting the patient. And that may either be because the uh, kidney cancer and the secondary kidney cancers are growing despite being on treatment, or it might be that the patient just can't tolerate the treatment or has had some um, unpleasant side effect that means that their oncologist and the patient don't want to carry on. So that's when we move on to second line treatments. So what are the current second line options? Well, I'm going to whiz through them all here. Um, oh, no, I'm going to go back a slide. Uh, hang on. 
There we go. So these are the currently licensed second line options that we have. The ones that have got little stars by them are actually first line options, but we're allowed to use them if a patient starts with just immunotherapy. Um, and, and we do that a little bit, um, but there isn't a lot of evidence to support that, but we are allowed to do it. The other drugs, axitinib, cabazantinib, nivolumab, and then vasinib and everolimus, um, all have reasonable degrees of evidence supporting why we can use them in the second line setting. And I'm going to talk about that evidence a little bit. I'm going to talk you through some of the clinical trials. Um, I'm going to do it um, at a relatively basic level so that I understand it. Um, uh, and, um, and I'll try and get across to you some of the benefits of these treatments, some of the limitations of the treatments as well, uh, and, and so an idea of how we might make that decision in an individual patient um, for which second line treatment do we get, because as you can see, there's a whole load of treatments there. So one of the important things talked about in June, um, and that you might hear your oncologist talking about, is your IMDC score or your risk category. Um, and this is very important because we use this to try and identify the best treatment for an individual patient. And it's a score that's generated based on a number of factors, which are quite straightforward. That's predominantly blood tests. Um, so your calcium level, your uh, hemoglobin, your red blood cell level, your white cell level, and your platelet level, plus your a thing called performance status, which is an assessment of how fit the patient is, how independent, how much they can do for themselves, and also how long it's taken from their diagnosis to requiring treatment. And you plug all of those into the formula, and that tells you whether the patient is in the favorable, intermediate, or poor prognostic group. And that both gives an indication of likely prognosis, but it also gives an indication of what the best treatment is. And we tend to use more of the tablet-based treatments if you're in the favorable risk group, and we tend to use more of the immunotherapy-based treatments if you're in the intermediate or poor group. And we tend to use this when we're making our decision around first-line treatment. It's not, we don't use it quite so much in the second line. So I'm not sure you can see that very well, but these are the European guidelines for um, first and second line treatment. And you can see that, or maybe you can't see actually, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. So that the top blurred red box says advanced kidney cancer, but it says something in front of kidney cancer. It says the word, the letters CC. And what that means is that means clear cell kidney cancer. Now, there are lots of different types of kidney cancer. There's about six or seven different subtypes. The most common one is clear cell kidney cancer. And almost all the clinical trials that have been done over the last 20 years have been done with clear cell kidney cancer patients. So that means if you've got a clear cell kidney cancer, we've got loads of evidence as to what the best treatment for you is. But conversely, if you are in the 20% of kidney cancer patients who don't have a clear cell tumor, you may have a papillary tumor or a chromophobe tumor or some other rarer subtype, we don't have anywhere near as much evidence suggesting what we can do. And I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit at the end with a slide about what the best treatment options are for that group of patients. So second line options, oh, ah, yes, so. Axitinib we'll talk about first. So axitinib is a, it was the first second line option to become available uh, in uh, kidney cancer when it came on the market. I, I remember I was working in Wolverhampton at the time and the only way you could get hold um, of this drug was through a clinical trial that was being run in Birmingham. And we referred all of our second line patients across to, to this study. Uh, I suspect Susan will remember this well. Um, and uh, there was a, a flow of patients from, uh, uh, from my center and other centers to, to the, the center in Birmingham. Um, so this was a study called the AXIS study. And this was for patients who'd had first line treatment, which back at this point, if you look at the date, this, this was published in 2011. This trial was done in the late 2010s or whatever they're called, the 20 noughties, I don't know. Um, but this study was comparing axitinib versus another drug called serafinib. And it showed that axitinib was a reasonable option as a second line drug. And we still use it in the second line setting. Um, the trial itself, these were people who'd had their first line treatment and then they progressed. Um, at the time this study was done, first line treatment was 
almost always the tablet based treatment. Most people had had a drug called sunitinib as a first line treatment. And then they were randomized between axitinib or serafinib. And axitinib was a better drug. Now, what this graph shows is uh, something called PFS, which stands for progression free survival. And what that means is that's how long the patient goes until their cancer starts growing again. Um, and so what this shows is that axitinib delayed the cancer growth. But that's the orange, orange, yellowy orange line that delayed the cancer growth longer than the drug serafinib did on average by an extra couple of months. So at the time, this wasn't a massive improvement in disease control, but it was something. It was moving in the right direction. And so as a result, this became the standard second line treatment from around about 2010 onwards. Um, and so patients would get their first line treatment and then they would move on to axitinib in the second line. Another drug came out around this time called Everolimus. Um, and again, this looked quite promising. Uh, based on the graph on the left-hand side, which shows that, again, Everolimus seemed to um, delay the growth of the cancer longer than placebo, i.e. longer than doing nothing. Um, but when you look at the graph on the right-hand side, this is the survival curve. It shows that actually Everolimus did not prolong survival at all in patients when compared to doing nothing. And as a result, we don't use Everolimus very much anymore. We do still sometimes use it. And I've had some patients who've actually done very well on it, but overall it doesn't prolong survival. And so this drug didn't really get widely used on its own. Well, what's the next second line option? Um, it's a drug called cabozantinib. Now, some of you may have had this drug. It's used quite widely. I have a lot of patients on this drug uh, and it's one of my preferred second line options, actually. Uh, this drug was compared to Everolimus, uh, in a clinical trial. This trial was published in 2015, so it's a few years later now. Um, and again, uh, what this showed was that, um, and it's, again, it's in one of these, we call these Kaplan-Meier curves. Oncologists get very excited about them. We, we have them up in our bathrooms and things. Um, and they, But they show, they're a very good graphical way of showing the benefit of a drug. Uh, and so you can see the green line is Everolimus, and those are the that shows you how long the patient's uh, cancers remain controlled. And then the the, re, the blue line is cabozantinib. And so again, cabozantinib seemed to add, on average, about an extra three to four months of disease control uh, compared to Everolimus. And we know that Everolimus was a bit better than doing nothing. Um, and so as a result of this, cabozantinib became one of the established second line treatments. My own experience with cabozantinib is that it, it works for a minority of patients, but the patients it does work for, it works quite well and typically will keep their cancer controlled for quite some time. Um, about one in four, one in five patients will probably benefit from this drug in the second line setting. So it's one of our standard, one of our standard treatments. The next um, combination to come along or drug to come along was nivolumab. Now, those of you who've been paying attention will be able to tell me what type of drug nivolumab is because it ends in MAB rather than NIB. Um, and so this is a, a one of these monoclonal antibody immunotherapy drugs. And so this was uh, the first second line immunotherapy drug to come um, into practice. And this actually got a license in the second line before it got a license in the first line. So the point at which we started using this drug, we didn't have immunotherapy in the first line. So this was the first option for patients to get immunotherapy. And this study also came out in 2015. Um, and again, it was compared to Everolimus. This is the kind of standard comparator arm because we know it's okay. It's fairly well tolerated, but it's not overly effective. And this, what this study showed uh, this is overall survival, was that there was an improvement. There is a gap between these two curves. So the patients on the uh, kind of teal blue line on the top uh, on the volume app, they're living longer. The other really interesting thing is we look at the survival here. You're out towards 33 months at the end and almost half the patients are still alive. Now, in the second line setting in kidney cancer back in the 2010s, that was quite a remarkable clinical trial when it came out and it showed that patients were doing with kidney cancer were doing so much better than they'd been doing five years or 10 years previously. 
And this was the first study to really show a significant benefit for immunotherapy in kidney cancer. We've subsequently gone on to use it quite extensively in the first line, both on its own or in combination with other drugs. But this was a, a real groundbreaking study. It showed us for the first time that immunotherapy had a, a, a real survival advantage. The average survival in the nivolumab patients was 25 months, so almost two years on second line treatment. And that at the time was a real groundbreaking thing. And bear in mind, when we talk about averages here, we're talking about a median. So that means the point at which half the patients um, have had an event, be that progression or, or maybe they've died, but the other half of the patients are still alive, they're still responding and they're still doing well. And we have patients now who've been on nivolumab for between five and 10 years uh, with um, kidney cancer and are doing really well. So for a group of patients, we see tremendous long-term outcomes. The difficulty is we can't predict in advance who's gonna be the patients who respond well to immunotherapy. We wish we could, because we could target the treatment better. What else do we have? So we've talked about some um, uh, tablet-based treatments, axisnib and cabozantinib. We've talked about an immunotherapy agent, nivolumab. We're now gonna talk about lenvatinib and everolimus. So this is a combination of two drugs. We talked about everolimus earlier. We said it wasn't on its own. It's not particularly effective. It has some benefits. It's quite well tolerated. And lenvatinib is a newer, um, one of these so-called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these, these targeted drugs that was given as a tablet. And this combination uh, was looked at in this study, uh, which compared lenvatinib and everolimus um, uh, either on their own or in combination. And this study came out in 2015 as well. It took a bit longer to get established because um, it's a smaller study. In the study, the patients either got the drugs in combination or they got one drug or they got the other drug. Uh, again, this was a second line study um, and patients were followed up to see um, how long they lived and how well they responded to treatment. And there's a huge gap here but and this is they've just looked at the combination of the two drugs, which is the top line and the one drug on its own, the bottom line. And you can see a big gap, meaning the patients on the combination are living significantly longer. And the the average time the cancer remained under control on this treatment went up from five and a half months for Everolimus to nearly 15 months on the combination. So for a little while, this became uh, one of our preferred second line treatment combinations because it really seemed to significantly prolong patients life expectancy um, but then it almost became a uh, or it has recently become a bit of a victim of its own success because the drug lenvatinib has now become established in the first line uh, and as we'll discover in a minute uh, the options that we choose in the second line are very much dictated by what the patient has had in the first line but this the time looked really really good so what are the basic principles of set of treatment? Well, you always want to use your most effective drug first because, you know, when a patient has an advanced kidney cancer, you want to try and get it under control quickly um, so that you can give the patient the, the, the maximum time, but also the best quality of life. Um, so you're always going to use your best drugs up front. Um, and so when you then come to choosing a second line drug, if a patient has um, stopped responding to their first line drug, obviously, what you give them second line is going to be in determined by what they've had in the first line. So if you've had an immunotherapy drug in the first line, you can't have another immunotherapy drug in the second line. So you'll have to have one of the targeted agents. And you, and if you've had a combination of an immunotherapy drug plus a targeted agent, you can't have that same targeted agent again in the second line. So we have quite a few options in the second line, but it's really a decision made on an individual patient basis. So I sit down, I will sit down with my patient and I will say, well, you've had this in the first line. It's worked brilliantly for six months or a year or two years or however long. It's not working anymore. So we now need to give you something else, but we can't give you these drugs because you've already had them. So these are our options. And then we have a bit of a discussion around what's the best option next. And it depends a little bit on what the patient wants, whether they're more interested in 
shrinking the cancer or controlling the cancer and having good quality of life or, or whatever their priorities are. And then you can choose a drug because we do know that some of these second line drugs have slightly more side effects, but are more likely to shrink the cancer. Other ones have fewer side effects, but maybe don't shrink the cancer so much. Uh, and so there's a there's a balance to be struck. And there's always a balance between quality of life and efficacy with treatment. And that's, you know, you've always got to explore that every time you make a treatment decision together. So that's really the basic options with second line. First line is very easy. It's all determined by your IMDC risk group classification. That tells you what drugs you can use. But in the second line, you've actually got much more choice, um, but it's really determined by the drugs the patient has already had and what the patient wants to do going forwards. Um, so that's the basics of second line treatment. And I'll happily take questions at the end. Um, but the other couple of things I wanted to talk about, what about the non-clear cell cancers? So we've got 20% of patients who do not have a clear cell kidney cancer. They have a 15% of them will have papillary tumors and the remaining 5% will have a load of other rare stuff like chromophobe cancers and, and collecting duct carcinomas and, and, and TFE mutations and all sorts. So um, what do we do with those patients? And then the final thing is what about adjuvant therapy. What does that mean? What does that look like? And how's that going to change things? So the basic answer with non-clear cell cancers, the majority of which are papillary cancers, is there's really only a couple of drugs that have been shown to be specifically effective in this group of patients. There have not been many uh, trials done because the cancers are quite rare. Uh, we know that the drug cabozantinib, which is one of these targeted agents, is effective in papillary tumors. There's a, um, there's a drug called savalitinib, which um, you can't access through the NHS. It's got some activity in, in cancers that carry a particular mutation. Um, but interestingly, through the Cancer Drugs Fund, which funds most of these expensive cancer um, therapies, you can actually use pretty much all of the standard therapies in non-clear cell cancers. They've relaxed the guidelines, I think, because there's a recognition that it's not fair on patients who have non-clear cell cancers that they don't get access to these drugs, but also that we're never likely to have the clinical trial evidence. So in oncology, we always like to be able to say to the patient, well, this is likely to work because we've done a trial with thousand people in it and we've demonstrated that it's safe and that it works and that it's going to prolong your life by this long and these are the likely side effects. But there are always some cases when you've got rare tumours that you're just never going to generate that kind of clinical trial data and you know and in that situation you either say well I can't give you any treatment because there's no data and that's clearly not fair or you say I can give you treatment but there's not a lot of data to go on therefore the benefits are very uncertain and that's what we tend to do with these non-clear cell cancers you know we say there is a little bit of data for some of the drugs but actually we tend to try the drugs that we know work best in clear cell and we try those in non-clear cell there are some uh, restrictions. It depends on the individual funding of the individual drugs. But generally speaking, we can get access to these drugs. And we didn't used to. It used to be very restrictive. If you were unfortunate enough five or 10 years ago to have a papillary tumor, you would find that a lot of the treatments were not available to you. And that was something that used to drive us up the wall because we desperately wanted to get access. And some of the drug companies were quite good. They would give us compassionate use programs for these patients with the rarer tumors, but some didn't. So, so things have improved, um, but we still, there's a lot of more uncertainty about the benefits of these treatments. And the final thing I want to talk about is adjuvant therapy. So what does adjuvant therapy mean? Well, this is where you've had your, your operation, um, you've had your cancer removed, but as with any cancer, there is always the possibility your cancer might come back. Uh, and we use adjuvant therapy in all sorts of tumor types. We use it in breast cancer, in lung cancer, bowel cancer. We use it in, in melanoma. We use it in bladder cancer. And until recently, kidney cancer was the one and only cancer in which there was no convincing evidence of benefit for adjuvant therapy. And they looked at using chemotherapy and it didn't work. They looked at using some of these targeted therapies that we found were quite effective in the, with more advanced cancers. They didn't seem to work in um, the adjuvant setting. But then um, last year, um, a trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the role of a drug called pembrolizumab. 
Now, of course, you're all experts by now. You'll know that pembrolizumab is a monoclonal antibody and is an immunotherapy agent. And the trial showed that if you gave a year of immunotherapy to patients who'd had a complete resection of their kidney cancer, but were at quite a high risk of recurrence, the risk of their cancer coming back over the first two years was reduced from 77% to 68%, so about a 9% reduction in the risk of their cancer coming back. Now, that's great. And this was the first positive adjuvant study we had ever seen in um, kidney cancer. And as a result, pembrolizumab initially got uh, a license through a kind of expanded access program, which we had open here in Birmingham. We've treated quite a few patients on that. Uh, now it is more widely available. Um, not for all patients, just for patients who have got relatively high risk um, kidney cancers, and it has to be a clear cell cancer. Again, this is one of those situations where if it's a papillary tumor or something else, that the data just isn't there. Um, but of course, there are some downsides to this. The first downside is that the majority of these patients will have been cured anyway. And so we are probably unnecessarily treating a group of patients because we cannot predict at this stage who is going to relapse and who isn't. Secondly, these treatments do have side effects. And whilst most people tolerate immunotherapy well, some people do get severe side effects and these can be life-changing side effects. And this could be in patients who are otherwise cured. So we have to be a little bit careful. The final confusing thing in this area is recently a series of trials with other immunotherapy agents have been published and they have all been negative. So they've shown that the immunotherapy has not improved survival. So that's true with the drug atezolizumab and also with the combination of apilimumab and nivolumab. And there are various reasons for that, but it's just made us feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you look at the pembrolizumab study, the positive study, statistically, the likelihood of this chance, this result having happened by chance is less than one in 20. So we think it is a genuine result. And why pembrolizumab works when the other drugs don't, because they're all very similar drugs, we just don't know at this point. But this is the first time we've had a drug that following surgery has been shown to certainly reduce the risk of recurrence, and that will probably translate into an improvement in cure. So we're excited about this, um, and we think it's going to change the face of um, kidney cancer because we will be able to prevent recurrences rather than waiting for recurrences and then treating them. Um, so patients are being offered this. I've got quite a few patients on this treatment. I have a very honest discussion with them all about the limitations of the data, the fact that this trial only came out a couple of years ago. So the data are not mature. We don't have long-term follow-up. You know, this could turn out to not be as good as we think. Uh, and also I, I discuss with patients the fact that similar studies with other drugs have all come back negative. And that just makes us feel a little more uncomfortable. And generally I find that some patients are keen to go for this and other patients just don't, they don't want to take the risk. They'd rather just carry on with their lives. And that's an individual decision. And, you know, we respect everyone's decisions. So that's adjuvant th therapy. Um, it's all quite interesting. Um, and that's a big question mark. So that means I, I've stopped prattling on and I'm very happy to take any questions from um, anybody, uh, as long as it's not a really hard question from Susan, obviously. <laughs> I'll stop sharing uh, and then uh, I think we can all, we all kind of reappear, don't we? Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> I'm right? going to let everyone in. I think that's the best way of doing it. Um, and then everyone, if that's okay, and then please, you can either ask questions by putting your hand up or we have the chat box or the question and answer box. Somebody's actually put a question in there um, to Simon um, with regard to IMS scope risk groups. Is a patient's risk group only determined prior to first line treatment? So that's an excellent question. It's a question that often vexes us and a question I often ask my registrars, actually. Uh, the question is, uh, the, the answer is yes, at the moment it is. We don't tend to recalculate it again because it's only relevant in terms of both prognosis and treatment decisions for first line treatment. So your subsequent treatment really depends on, you know, is, is determined by your response to your, your initial treatment. So, yeah, it's just for first line. That's great because um, this is this was Carl's question. So he said, put it another way, I'm on a second line treatment now. If I I determine my IMDC risk based on current data, 
would that be of an of any predictive value? No, that there's no because of the way the data was generated, it doesn't really predict prognosis um, and it doesn't affect treatment choices. Prognosis in the second line setting is going to be far more determined by how well you did in the first line and how well you're responding to your second line treatment. That's a great question, Carl. Mm. Yeah, my registrars would struggle with that. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Is that you, Richard? We can't hear you. Yes, it is. I was trying to type it in the chat. But <laughs> That's OK. It takes me far too long. Just, um, just chat away. Are there any agreed third line treatments? I know we've seen all the second lines. And if so, are you going to do a third seminar? Yeah. So, I mean, I can cover the third line treatments really quite quickly. Generally speaking, in the third line, you can have anything that you haven't already had in the first or second line. There are a couple of restrictions. Some of the drugs, because of the way their licenses um, are only funded in the second line. So, um, and, 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 but you can, your oncologist can usually find a way around that in all honesty. Um, but yeah, basically it's in the third line, I would give things if people haven't had it in the first or second line. Okay, thank you. And the same argument goes for fourth line. And, for, you know, I do have patients who are on, I can think of one lady, one gentleman I've got who's on, fifth line treatment and I've got a lady on fourth line treatment so you, you know you want to maximize the number of lines of treatment but equally you, because people do sometimes get less well as they move on you, you want to give your best treatments up front hey Richard um, anyone else I'm throwing one Oh, no. Is there another one here? Um, oh, they're saying thank you. Oh, they're all saying thank you, Simon. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're all saying thank you. Richard, Richard's got his hand up. I'm being greedy. <laughs> this, this isn't actually for me because I'm not in this situation. Um, but if you've been on something like nivolumab yeah. and you've got to a stage after two plus years that you're stable and your cancer's controlled, is there an argument for adjuvant treatment for those patients? So the only situation that we would use that you can use adjuvant treatment so that so you have to have a situation where the patient has no residual cancer left in their body to have to receive adjuvant therapy. So you can have it after your original your initial operation. So you have your kidney removed. If the surgery has gone well, there's nothing left behind. You can have a year of adjuvant therapy. The second setting is if you've had your kidney removed and then you relapse with disease that's just localized, that can be removed. Um, and once that's removed, you've then, although you've then got stage four disease, it's completely resected stage four disease and you can have adjuvant therapy in that setting. Um, so you couldn't have it if you've been on nivolumab for advanced disease and it's all disappeared, you would probably just remain on nivolumab or a treatment break. But I've had a patient recently who had his kidney out 10 years ago. He was going for a hip replacement. He had scans done and they found this funny lump sitting by his hip. So they biopsied it and it was recurrent kidney cancer. Um, and then, so we scanned him, we then did a PET CT scan and we found that he also had something in his lung. Um, and so we have, we've given Sabre radiotherapy to the thing in his lung and the surgeons, um, our, our orthopedic oncology surgeons have removed the thing from his hip. So I am now giving him adjuvant therapy because he's had a recurrence, but it's been completely removed and there is no evidence of any recurrent disease. So that's the only kind of slightly unusual scenario that you can give adjuvant therapy, in, if that made sense. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Siobhan, you got a question. Hi, I came in very late. I may have you may have covered this already, but is there ever a case? I mean, how long can you go along having nivolumab for? Is is there an end to funding? Yeah. So um, my understanding with so so I treat melanoma and kidney cancer, and the rules are different for reasons I don't understand. So in melanoma, you can carry on forever. But I think with kidney cancer, I think it stops after two years. 
I might be wrong about that, but I think that's right. Well, um, I'm that... still having it, and I'm more than two years. Okay, so you you so... you may have yeah, it, it may be that the rules have changed. Actually, I haven't had anyone come up to two years recently, so I haven't rechecked what the CDF rules are because they do often change. I know in a lot of tumor sites, uh, immunotherapy is only funded for two years, and the, the, there are two rationales for that. The first one is purely financial because it's it's expensive. The other one, and so that doesn't really make clinical sense. The other one is that the majority of people, if they get to two years on immunotherapy, they have got a durable response. And we certainly find this in melanoma that if you stop their immunotherapy, they usually go on and have a long term remission. Um, and but the difference is in melanoma, if you stop, you are allowed to restart whereas that's not the case in other tumor sites. So we're a bit more confident of doing it in melanoma. Um, but you can, you know, as long as it's funded, you can stay on it long term. There's no cumulative toxicity. Your, your risk of autoimmune side effects does increase a little bit with time, but not dramatically so. Um, and so, yeah, if you're still on it and it's still working, um, then absolutely stay on it. Okay, thank you. Another question that that was posed to us by Susan that was actually saying that she was of the understanding that the, she was only allowed three lines of treatment. Um, can you clarify that, Simon? Yeah, that no. So, so it depends on what lines you've had. Some of the drugs you are only allowed. So if, if I, um, I know I'm, I can see my slides and you can't, but if I look at my, the, 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 the second line options that we talked about. So axitinib is Technically, you're only allowed to give it in the second line, but actually you can get away with giving it in the third line. Cabozantinib is not restricted to any specific line, so you can give that anywhere. The same is true with nivolumab. Um, lenvatinib and everolimus, you are only allowed to give um, as a second line if they've had a, a TKI before, so one of the other targeted agents. So depending on in what order you've had your drugs uh, and what treatments you've had, you can have more than three lines, but it depends if you run out of available drugs. So, um, and particularly now, because we're using combinations in the first line, we're particularly using these immunotherapy and TKI combinations like avelumab, axitinib, pembrolizumab, um, uh, and lenvatinib. That does reduce the number of available drugs you've got later on. But I still would prefer to do that because these combinations are so effective in the first line that you it, it's better to give you good stuff up front. But that there's no rule that says you can't go beyond third line treatment, but it depends in your individual case on what drugs you've already had and what drugs are still available to you. Great. I may Any have just more? caused trouble between you and your oncologist, but I apologize for that. <laughs> I think there's somebody else that's just asking. Um, another question by, from Chris, Christopher. Hi, Simon. Great webinar. Thank you. I had a partial nephrectomy in 2011 on the right kidney and another partial nephrectomy on my left kidney in 2020. Last year, I had spread to my lower spine, which was treated with Sabre. Since then, I'm being CT scanned every three months and I'm stable. Should I be on adjuvant therapy, do you think? So... This is a question that people aren't terribly sure about whether, and I've got a patient like this who's who's had one site of recurrence that's been treated with Sabre, and it's the question of does that count as having completely, you know, resected metastatic disease? You know, because Sabre is given with curative intent usually, um, you know, it's an ablative therapy. So it, it's it's un, it's unclear. I, I think you possibly could consider being offered it, but you'd have to start it. So the rules um, and the funding and the clinical trial was done. People had to start their adjuvant therapy within three months of their surgery slash definitive treatment. So if you're still within three months of your Sabre, then potentially you could be offered it. It would depend a bit on your oncologist's interpretation of the rules. Um, I have offered it to a patient in that setting, although they actually declined it. Um, so I, I didn't have to do any battle with the funding authorities. But so in theory, yes, because Sabre is a curative ablative treatment, um, but you would need to start your treatment. It's There's a three month window after the end of treatment, uh, according to the uh, guidance. Thank you for that, Simon. Anybody else? 
anymore. I mean, if anybody does think of other questions um, or, you know, you speak to your colleagues or your friends and they say, oh, why didn't you ask that? You know, you can always contact Susan um, or anybody else at C uh, Kidney Cancer UK and they can always they get in contact with me and I, I will get back to you. It might take a while because I'm a bit slow at responding to emails at the moment because I'm a bit snowed under, but I will always get back to you. Um, yeah, so I'm always happy to answer questions kind of remotely in that way. That's brilliant. And as I said before, um, if, if everybody was a bit late coming in, um, Simon did do the, the first session on the first line therapy treatment. So obviously you can access that through the Kidney Cancer UK we uh, website on the webinars as well. And obviously this one will be uploaded to that. So obviously we don't expect you to remember everything that has been said because we, we can't. So that you can always reference that um, in the, on the on the website. You can do a quiz at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, Simon, a huge thank you. But lots of thank yous in the chat, Simon. Thank you. Yes. Pleasure. Thank you so absolute, much. absolute pleasure. And uh, I, I wish you all of the very best. And say, always happy to answer any queries. Lovely. Thank you very much for supporting us again. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely evening. And, and uh, I'm, I'm thank sure you. I'll speak to you all again soon. Yes. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.